Now, when you open the shader menu and you see all of these node options, it can be absolutely overwhelming, especially if you're new to texturing in Blender. So what we're going to do in this video is look at some of the most common nodes used in material creation, common use case elements for each of these nodes, and hopefully demystifying them to make it easier for you to create your own shaders. But that's enough talking. Let's dive in and take a look at some of these commonly used nodes. Now you can access all the shader nodes in the shader editor menu, which is where you can build out your materials in Blender. To access these nodes, you can either hit Shift A, just like you would with primitives in the viewport, or you can come up here to the add menu and look here. If you're struggling to find what you're looking for, when you hit Shift A, click search and you can search for it. For example, I can search for bump node and click and get that node here. You can also drag off of nodes and it will automatically give you a search menu. So if I wanted to look for a image texture, I could do that in that way as well. And when done this way, it will automatically connect the two. You can delete nodes by pressing the delete key or the X key, which will automatically delete it and its connection. Now let's take a look at the most commonly used nodes in Blender and what they're used for. If you're finding this tutorial useful, then check out the full course, which is part of my series on becoming a Blender beginner to a professional, all about getting started in Blender and getting you started up so that you can start working professionally in Blender. Layer weight lets you control effects based on the viewing angle of the camera, useful for things like lighting or Fresnel reflections. This is actually how to get that fake rim light effect you see in Super Mario Galaxy. You can control the strength with the blend option here at the bottom, and you can choose to output either the Fresnel or the facing faces as the determining factor. The bevel node simulates adding bevels to the edges, softening sharp edges by faking a small bevel, which helps catch highlights and adds realism without extra geometry. This will not replace the bevel node, but it can be great for adding small details to sharp edges. Now geometry nodes a bit more complicated, but it's great here because it gives us the normal information, which we can then mix with other nodes for example, in this scenario here, to create a edge wear mask. The light path node provides information about how light rays reach the surface, direct, indirect, reflections, and more. If that sounds complicated, it's because it is, but I want you to pay attention to the top one here, the is camera ray. This one's super simple to use and extremely useful. Let's take a look at a sci-fi object here. I can determine what objects are visible to the camera or not. So we're going to plug two emission shaders into a mix shader node here. And then to determine how to mix those, we will plug the is camera ray. Now with one of these emission shaders, we can control the strength of the emission in terms of how it lights the scene. And with the other one, we can control the visuals of the emission. This is great because sometimes to cast a lot of lighting in your scene, you have to turn the value so high that it completely turns all of your emission elements white. And that's not always what you want. The texture coordinate node tells Blender how to map textures onto your model, whether it be by object space, UVs, or camera projection. The generated node here will try and generate coordinates with Blender's best guess. This yields mixed results unless if you have super simple objects. The UV will default to your UV maps that you've placed on your object. The object node allows you to use an object selected here to control the coordinates of your texture. This is great for animating textures. I actually use this to animate the displacement noise map on this fire here to generate this fire animation. Camera will project the texture from the camera view. The problem is if you are animating your characters or moving the camera scene, the textures will move around. However, if you have a still scene, this can be a really simple and fast way to project complex patterns on objects. The mapping node lets you move, rotate, or scale textures after they're applied. So you can fine tune how they sit on your surface, including tiling your textures by increasing the scale. Oftentimes, these are paired with a texture coordinate node. Object info outputs data about the object's position, rotation, and scale. But what I use it for most often is this random option down here. What this will do is when a material is applied to a object, it will randomize per object. So if I take this random, plug it into a color ramp here, choose several colors, and plug it into the output of the base color here, and then I duplicate these books around my scene, you'll see that it is randomly choosing colors from that color ramp for every new object duplicated. This is a great way to add variety to your scenes quickly. The ambient inclusion node adds an ambient inclusion pass to the objects with the materials applied. It adds shading to small crevices and corners, making them look darker and giving surfaces extra depth and realism. This is great for things, for example, like brick, where you wanna darken the shadows and the crevices and bring a little bit more attention to the depth. Brightness and contrast adjust how light or dark your textures look with the brightness, or how strong the difference is between light and dark areas with the contrast. Hue, saturation, and value lets you shift the color and the hue or make it more or less intense with saturation and control how light and dark it appears overall with the value. Curves give you fine control over color and brightness by adjusting the curve here in the middle. 
It lets you brighten midtones, darken shadows, or tweak individual color channels here at the top. The mix node blends two inputs, usually colors, shaders, or textures into one output. The factor slider controls how much of each input is used. Factor zero would be 100% of input A. Factor one would be 100% of input B. Factor 0.5 would be a perfect blend between A and B. Think of it like layers in Photoshop. You're deciding how much of the top layer shows versus the bottom layer. Kind of like mixing paint. Slide towards one color for dominance or leave it in the middle for a blend. You can also plug masks into the factor here. For example, we could plug a grunge map in and mix two colors together. This one is used quite frequently in procedural materials as it enables a lot of control and mixtures between maps. The color ramp node remaps values into colors, letting you turn black and white data like a gradient or a mask into a custom color range. You can also use this to adjust and alter maps by crunching the contrast. This one's used quite frequently to alter image maps or to inject random colors into your object. Map range takes an input value and shifts it from one range into another, like turning numbers from 0 into 10 into a new scale of 0 to 1. The math node performs simple math operations like add, subtract, multiply, or more on values. This is useful for fine-tuning textures or combining effects or altering things like noise. Vector math does the same thing as the math node, but just operates an entire vector. If you don't know, vectors are when you have a x, y, and z numbered together, useful for things like measuring distances, normalizing directions, or combining motion. This one tends to be a bit more complicated than anything you're likely to use, but it's good to know that it's here. Separate x, y, and z splits a 3D vector into individual x, y, and z components so you can control one direction at a time. Now that might sound complicated, but a great use case of this is to plug this with a color ramp node on a gradient node, and you can control the direction the gradient goes, whether it goes in the X direction, the Y direction, or the Z direction by changing the input here. The brick texture procedurally generates a repeating brick-like pattern with control over brick size, mortar thickness, and colors, with plenty of options here. The checker texture creates a simple checkerboard pattern, great for testing UVs or making stylized surfaces. The gradient texture produces a smooth transition between values useful for fades, masks, or stylized shading effects. Veroni texture generates organic cell-like patterns based on distance between random points. This is great for things like stone, skin, or abstract effects. The wave texture creates a repeating wave patterns in lines, bands, or rings, often used for stylized surface or distortion effects. This is great for wood patterns or creating stripes. The image texture loads an external image file like PNG or JPEG and maps it onto your 3D model using UVs or other coordinates. You can also create new image maps here, which is great for creating things like UV grids, or texture paint maps. The principal hair BSU node is a shader designed specifically for rending realistic hair. Now hair isn't a flat surface, it's like a thin cylinder. So when light hits it, it doesn't just bounce back, it bends around, scatters throughout the strands and reflects. This aims to do that while not taking very long to render. It has a color and melanin section to define natural hair colors such as blonde, brown, black by controlling the pigment concentration. It has a roughness and randomness option which adjusts how shiny or matte each strand is and adds natural variations from strand to strand. It also has a radial roughness, which controls how light spreads along and around the hair strand. There's also the IOR selection, which fine tunes the strength of highlights and reflections in the hair. Now, just like the object info node, we also have a curve info node, and we can use this to plug things into the hair BSDF and generate some pretty cool effects on our curves. For example, we can randomize some of the color hair strands with a color ramp, or we can change the color from the root of the hair to the tip of the hair. The principal volume shader node plugs into the volume output instead of the shader output, and it's designed for rendering materials that aren't solid surfaces, but instead fill up space. Things like fire, fog, or clouds. The density will control how dense that object is or how thick the volume is. The color will tint what that looks like. A common trick is to add a noise into the density here and get a much more realistic looking fog when placed in your scene. You can also place this over objects with lights and get volumetric lighting in your scenes as well. Now there is another model type called VDB models and simulation software for smoke and fire will export VDB models. If you buy or download some of those models and import them into Blender, you can plug them into the volume here and use the black body intensity to control the intensity of the fire or explosion simulation that you've imported. The principal BSDF node is Blender's all-in-one shader. It works on almost every surface and it combines many shading models into one easy node. So instead of building complex networks, you can just create wood, plastic, glass, skin, or metal with just a handful of sliders right here. It's the Swiss Army knife of shaders. Let's look at some of the key controls. The base color, which will be the main controller of the material. 
Metallic, which will tell Blender if the surface is metal or not. Roughness, which will control the shininess or the matte of your object. Specular, which will adjust the strength of non-metal reflections. Higher values equal stronger highlights. The normal bump input, which adds surface detail for fake lighting information. The transmission here, which is used to make materials see-through, like glass or water. The index of refraction, or IOR, which controls how light bends in transparent materials, such as glass or water. There's a clear coat option here to add an extra shiny layer on top, like car paint or varnished wood. There's also a subsurface option. This simulates light scattering under the surface, useful for skin, wax, or marble. You can plug image maps into all of these for PPR materials, or you can utilize all of these individually to build out procedural materials within Blender. Let's take a look at how we could create a simple wax material. First, we'll choose a color up here. I'm going to choose a color like a darker yellow or orange. I then want it to have light passing through it. So we will turn the subsurface scattering up to one as well. The problem is that the light is passing through my entire object. I just want it to pass through the thin bits or the edges. So we will take a layer of weight node, plug a color ramp on it, and then we can plug this into the subsurface strength. Now we'll only get that pass through lighting around the edges of our object, giving us a more realistic wax looking texture. This is just one example. Now we just covered a lot of nodes and it might be hard to digest, but I encourage that you return to this video and watch it one more time after you have a better understanding of some of the nodes and it might help you think about how you could use these in your own projects.